Dean, uh, I will start to share uh, the screen momentarily. Again, welcome old friends coming back. This is the first session of this spring season. Uh, every first Friday, uh, we are gathering here online, read aloud together and learn a classical Chinese poem. And if you've been here, you can have your pen or pencil or anything ready with a piece of paper. Um, we will use that later. And for this season, we are actually uh, introducing some new elements at the uh, as as part of the the session. Uh, so you will see uh, starting today. How the? Let me uh, start sharing my screen. Whoops. Ah, uh, <laughs> I have to go back. Oh no. Hold on. Oh. I will stop sharing. Sorry. Uh, let me go back. And first of all, let me. Uh, well, I'm not here alone. Uh, I'm here with my team. Uh, so I will also turn this to my colleagues while they will introduce themselves. And because we are still technically in the middle of Chinese New Year. They will also share one expression for Chinese New Year. Uh, Yongqiang, oh, hey. this is strange, sorry. Okay, good. There you go. Okay. How about well, Yongqiang, you are already start a talking, yeah. <laughs> Introduce yourself, please. Okay. So I say, And uh, also, <laughs> and uh, And next to Meng Yun is uh, Li Tong. Thank you. And lastly, from me, um, 合家欢乐. So I want to ask, I know we are open to everyone. Uh, if anyone has got the meaning of any of the expressions, 有没有谁? 我懂了。啊哈，小安，你听听懂了哪一句？我每一句都听懂了。嗯，每一句是如意，is uh, <笑> like may everything go as you wish. 合家欢乐 is like your whole family, like may they be happy. And 恭喜发财 is like congratulations and like make money, like get rich, right? Very good. Oh my God. Very good. Is Cantonese. 恭喜发财. It's said, well, it can be said both Cantonese or uh, Mandarin Chinese. Uh, in, if it's in um, Cantonese, it will uh, be pronounced slightly differently. Actually, Li Tong, Li Tong is from Canton region. Uh, can you say it in Cantonese? Mm. Yeah, you can hear the difference, right? All right. Let's, well, maybe just let's go over this. Thank you, Xiao. Uh, you not only get all the meaning, you have a very good memory. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so maybe, well, since it's a reader loud, well, we can say it together. Uh, start from the top. I have pinyin on the top at the Chinese character at the bottom. This is the, just the very, Generic. 恭喜, 恭喜. 恭喜, 恭喜. 恭喜, 恭喜. Very good. The next one is Happy New Year and make a good fortune. 恭喜发财. 恭喜发财. 很好. And the next one, wish everything go at... Uh, yeah, wish everything to your um, expectation. 
，事事如意。And finally, of course,、um, for Chinese New Year, it's the time the families coming together, 合家欢乐，合家欢乐 Very good. Wow, it's all red and the gold or yellow color just for the season. How that's our Lunar New Year. Good wishes for everyone, and let's go into the poem today.、Um, Bai Mei. So, for new friends, especially, we are focusing on one poem. We may not have a lot of time to go into the meanings. So, all the、um, slides. Mostly will be bilingual, and we will read aloud together and with some guidance.、Uh, just don't worry、uh, if you see some of the、um, the, the poems that well you you don't have the meaning or you don't know how to read it yet. So this is well by Wang Mian, a poet from fourteenth early fourteenth century. The translator. Also, our old friend, translator,、uh, um, Xu Yuanchong from China. Let's first going into. You will see while、well, this white mume, um, like it's it's a it's a word I'm not too familiar with actually. Uh, had to go into that, and we will talk about that a little bit, because this mium is to translate the flower, mei, in Chinese, and white is bai, and the translation is right here. There are two Chinese characters, bai, mei, yet there are four English words here, in order to actually. Translate the meaning of the title. Shenzhan, that M U M E, is not it from the Latin one? That is called mume. Oh, thank you. I actually was just trying to get mume. That that could be. I I don't know exactly. Um, I was looking at the the meaning of this um、uh, mume. And it's、uh, more of a technical、uh, name or term for this type of plum flowers, which、um, Xu Yuanchong select selected this specifically to make a distinction from the plum flowers we may be familiar with, because、um, mm -hmm. this is a distinctive、uh, Chinese plum, or also called Japanese、um, acro.、Uh, Apricot, yeah. That the Chinese Latin one is Prunus Mume. Exactly. Ah,、oh, thank you, thank you. Forgot. All right. So let's take a look at the entire poem. First, I will read the entire poem so we can get to the picture. It's a very short poem. And some of our、uh, friends would know this is a Hapta no, Hapta syllabic, quatrain, four lines. Each line has exactly seven characters. And this kind of poem, as well from previous sessions, lunch and learn sessions,、uh, we know in Tang Dynasty, the seventh to eighth century China. This form or this younger was at its peak. The most famous poems of this type were from that time period. But Chinese poets continue to write、uh, the the quatrains,、uh, the regulated uh, verses uh, after Tang Dynasty.、Uh, this poet from early fourteenth century. This is an example. 
And for this season, we, we actually carefully selected uh, all the poems uh, related to flowers or birds, uh, as this poem represents. Um, it's not only in, in spring at China Institute, we will have an exhibition on birds and flowers. So we can make some connections uh, with some of the masterworks of the paintings. Um, but also birds and flowers are a common theme in Chinese poems. And by reading them, uh, let's, uh, let's see why uh, it becomes such a common theme and what the poem and try to express. And also more importantly, how we can relate to these themes. All right, so from the top, I will read and if you know how to read, you can read after me. This time I will go slightly fast. Uh, I would invite you to look at the translation at the same time so um, uh, you can get the, the meaning across. Okay? Bai Mei. Bai Mei. Bing Xue Lin Zhong Zhuo Zi Shen. Bu Tong Tao Li. Wen Fang Chen. Fang Chen. Ku Ran Yi Ye. Qing Xiang Fa. San Zuo Qian Kun. Wan Li Chun. That's the entire poem. Under 30 characters. So each of this writing is a Chinese character. And we have the pinyin on the top. And this is just to get the sense of the um, of the rhyme, of the structure of the poem, the pronunciation. We will go into each character, read together one by one. Um, but I also, before that, I want to uh, just spend a little bit time talking about the, uh, the, the background. The poem by Wang Mian, as well just mentioned, is about this white chi Chinese plum flowers. So it's slightly different from the regular plum flowers uh, we may be familiar with to see here. It's one of the earliest flowers blossoming when the winter is not even over, often considered as the sign of spring. So as I'm introducing the flowers, also as well we continue to read, perhaps one question I would invite everyone to think is why the poet would be taking this flower uh, in the poem. Uh, what the flower uh, would symbolize for the poet. And it's a very common theme in Chinese or even in Asian um, poetry, art. Uh, there is a collective uh, consensus of what these Chinese plum flowers represent and where we can uh, think about it. And if we have time, we can discuss about that too. And in fact, Wang Mian is known, also known, actually most known as a prominent artist in early 14th century in Yuan Dynasty, particularly painting this type of plum blossoms. This is one of his many paintings on this subject. Uh, it's currently at the National Palace Museum uh, in fact, uh, at the Met and also Shanghai Museum and many other museums. These are the two that I actually uh, looked into. They have a collection of Wang Mian's uh, artwork about the plum blossoms. And Wang Mian himself, while mostly known as a painter, as an artist, uh, his family may from generations ago was uh, well to do and prominent, but by the time Wang Mian, um, uh, at Wang Mian's time, the family was actually in quite a poverty. And he particularly going through his own individual path 
to become a painter and an artist of his time, uh, which is quite unusual. And we introduced quite a few poets, prominent poets uh, from other time. And well, they're all coming from different family background. And another thing I want to mention is perhaps Wang Mian's time. Uh, this is we call Yuan Dynasty. It's from the late 13th century to mid 14th century. Wang Mian was born into and largely lived through this time, Yuan Dynasty. Its empire was first established by some of you may know Genghis Khan. Uh, at the time, it was only in the northern China was taken, and the territory of China, as well, we can see this is the current China's border, and the orange part is during the Yuan Dynasty, China's part. And these are, is, this is the empire established by the Mongols, uh, and while well, it, this is only in the China part, actually, it's all the way across uh, Central Asia and until Europe at different time. And by his grandson, the Kublai Khan, the entire Chinese territory was taken. So to the Chinese, Yuan, even though it's a short lived dynasty under 100 years, but for the first time, the Chinese uh, especially we call Han Chinese, uh, like Wang Mian. Um, the, it, it's for the first time that the entire area was under the ruling of uh, non-Han Chinese, um, the Mongols. Uh, not only the Mongols brought a very different culture to the Chinese, but at that time placed Han Chinese to the lower social class. So this is a very brief background of Wang Mian. And if we think about the flowers, the nature of the flowers themselves, as well as the social and historical context, that may help us also to understand the theme of this flower and what it might represent, especially from the poet's perspective. So let's go into each line and we, I will again read this twice. You will see actually four lines here. The top is the pinyin for each character. And then this is the English translation, literal translation of each character, which grammatically doesn't make any sense. And you will see the poetic translation, the last line. I will read twice. Um, the first time I will pause after each character. You can read after me. And the second time I will read the entire line and pause. So we all have time to read together. All right, okay. I will start. Bing. 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 Xue. 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 Lin. Lin, Zhong, 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 I want to just point out one thing. If you look at the translation and the literal translation, there may be a question like there is nothing representing pure in the character. Why? So again, trying to think about what the poet tries to express because the literal translation this is my literal translation it's basically in icy and snow forest you place yourself there's nothing referring directly to pure 
But the translator Xu Yuanchong, in fact, added that word in this line as in order to translate the, um, the meaning that he feels the poet trying to express. It's a translator's choice. Some translators may not choose that, um, but this is the case that specifically related to this word, pure. Next one. May I ask a question about- Sure. Zhuo? Right. What part uh, of speech is it? Is it a verb? Which? Zhuo, it's a verb here. It's actually like be attached or place yourself. Mm. Uh, it, it's not common in um, Baihua. It's not a Baihua usage. It's purely classical. Is it a purely classical use? It's more classical use because, and it also uh, has different pronunciations. Because if you look at this, usually now we use in the word like zhu ming, it's zhu, mm -hmm. zhu ming, famous. But mm -hmm. this one, it's a verb and it's in the classical sense. And also in order to rhyme, it's better to pronounce zhu instead of zhu. Mm, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Bu. Ooh. Pong, Pong. Pao. 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 Li. 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 Huan. Huan. Fang. 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 Chen. Chen. Bu Tong Tao Li. Huan Fang Chen. Similar, there is nothing speaking directly about splendor. So in this case, if I were to do a direct translation, and also the order of the words, well, the translator has a different way of organizing the, the word, the characters, uh, the translation for the characters. So more direct, I would do unlike peach and plum. So here is also, there is a plum, the regular sense of plum here. And that may be the reason for Xu Yuanchong to choose the Mu Mei as the title because these are two very different flowers. And one in this line uh, to compare with the, the Mu Mei, uh, Plum is, a, is completely in a different category with different um, qualities. So here, um, Marilyn, to your question for the first line, it's literally the Zhuo is, um, in complement with this word, huan. So to be mixed with the other flowers. Next, hu, hu, ran, 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 yi, 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 ye, 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 qing, 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 Xiang, 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 Ba, 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 Hu Ran Yi Ye, Qing Xiang Fa, Hu Ran Yi Ye, Qing Xiang Fa, Hong Hao. Last line, San, 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 Du, Du, Du. 钱, 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 坤, 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 
万里春。上座乾坤，晚雨春。好 ，Yeah, that's the entire poem. So perhaps I will read one more time. Let's read together the entire poem, and、uh, we have maybe a couple of minutes, and we can talk about how you feel about this poem and what qualities. That you feel the poet is trying to express of this flower of his choice, and given the nature of the flower itself, the context that the poet was living in,、um, what the the sy symbolic meanings that he's trying to、um, get through this poem. All right. Let's let's read this together. Bai Mei. Bai Bai Mei. Bing Xue Lin Zhong, Zhuo Zi Shen. Bing Xue Lin Zhong, Zhuo Zi Shen. Zhuo Zi Shen. 不同桃李混芳尘。不同不同桃李混芳尘，芳尘。很好。忽然一夜清香发，忽忽然一夜清香发。散作乾坤万里春。三座千春万里春。很好 ，the last three character， 万里春。万里春，春很好。Yeah. So, does anyone want to share? Your understanding this, of this poem, or how it's related to you? Yeah, Fu Jiemin raised your hand. Yeah, you can unmute yeah. yourself and yeah, speak. So I, I'm not、uh, entirely sure about this particular poet, but、uh, when I studied history, I know that、uh, in, in the course of the Chinese dynasties, the Yuan Dynasty, from the Han Chinese perspective, was kind of a dark. Period in that they were being kind of suppressed by the Mongols, who were who were tended to be very martial and kind of suppressed Han Chinese culture. And I, I don't, I, I think maybe now there's kind of a a historical revision where they think that you know maybe the Mongol period wasn't so dark as a lot of people made it out to be. But maybe this poet feels that you know Han Chinese culture is kind of being suppressed in the winter of Mongol rule, <laughs> and that. But during this, there'll be a spring, and that out of this springtime, a new、um, dynasty, the Ming Dynasty, will emerge and retake the the mantle of the Han Chinese Empire away from the the Mongol tyrants.、Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I can see quite a few has have raised your hand. Let me let、yeah. me see. Yeah, well, it's it's really、uh, it's great that while、well, you refer to the Mongol, the Yuan Dynasty,、uh, we <laughs> talked about that a little bit, and、uh, that、uh, oftentimes well is because well associated with how it's a winter time, it's a、uh, it's a suppressing suppressive time period for the Han Chinese and for Wang Mian. Who's Chinese and who's really seeing this flower blossoming in the winter, the coldest time of the year, and then give this、um, hope for spring? That that could be one of the、uh, interpretations.、Uh, and I can see who else want to speak.、Uh, Amita. Oh, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I um I had a question. I thought it was really interesting how you pointed out that the word pure translator really famous. And are there other translations of this poem that 
would use a different. Mm -hmm. words yeah, well, Xu Yuanchong is one of the best translators of Chinese classical literature. Um, so, and he, uh, yet he is, is known for adding his own interpretation and words in order to first, uh, he feels important to make it clear, especially um, cross-culturally, uh, if there's only direct translation um, for people who are not familiar with the flower, for example, I uh, may not really associate uh, with that kind of quality that he feels important to point out. Uh, and another thing is, well, he's known to add words in order to make it rhyme um, as, as it's, a, it's a poem. So he feels that's also important to keep the form poetic as well, even in the different language. Uh, but there are different translations for every poem that we select for the Lunch and Learn series, like every single one of them have different uh, translations. Uh, it's, so to a large extent, it, it is really the translator's choice. Yeah. And then maybe Gary? Uh, you have to unmute yourself too. Okay, I, I think it, it has to do with the plum blossom being the first <clears throat> blossom that you see in the winter. And because it lasts through ice and snow, unlike many other flowers, uh, that, that he's praising the strength, uh, the endurance, and the beauty of the plum blossoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We can actually see a lot of the direct reference in this poem, Bing Xue, and, uh, and you have Tao Li as a comparison, right? These are the flowers coming later mm -hmm. when the weather is much nicer and warm and a lot of flowers are blossoming. Yet, uh, this flower, Mei, the color is Bai Mei. In fact, it could, it could come in different colors, yellow, red, most common, and white. Uh, so, and also it has this uh, fragrance, even though the flower itself is not uh, the most brilliant of all, um, but the poet is absolutely praising uh, the time that it blossoms and also the fact that it brings the, this beautiful, refreshing uh, fragrance to the world, uh, even though without being visually uh, splendid as Tao or Li. So that's definitely one layer. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, and Samantha? I just wanted to say that I really like the contrast of the use of ice and snow with later in the second line saying that the other flowers are mixing with the dust. So I can kind of see where the word pure might have come from as a comparison of these flowers that emerge with this beautiful, you know, white snow and ice. Yeah, yeah, I, I could like, well, almost to smell that myself when when I read this. And in fact, that's one reason we uh, select this poem for this time. Uh, it's, it's still Lunar New Year for the Chinese. Um, it's cold, but this, this one is particularly uh, seasonal, yet uh, it's sort of bring the spirit up uh, for the season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I have uh, three hands in front of me. So perhaps, but we have a lot to, <laughs> to cover later. But uh, Beverly? Um, yeah, which, mm -hmm. my, uh, I don't know enough about Chinese history to have uh, an interpretation that's as deep as some of the others, but I know that pretty much anyone who lived in a cold place, and we're going through a cold, cold spell here in New York City, uh, <laughs> you look for it to be over. Yesterday was Groundhog Day on a very, uh, so unpoetic and unbeautiful, to the beautiful poem, you know, where we want to know how much longer is there going to be winter? And I know that, uh, uh, like here in my house, I look in the front yard, I have one crocus and I look for when it's trying to bloom. And then in March, we get the uh, forsythia. So that in terms of just 
being through with winter and wanting to welcome the spring because it's, everybody likes spring. Right, yeah. Thank you. Well, that's one thing that's cross-culturally could make us uh, feel uh, related. Uh, whether, yeah, it's exactly uh, for that. And Mark, please unmute yourself. Hi, this is actually Mark's wife, Lisa. We're watching it together. Shishini. Um, <laughs> Hello. So I, the, I wanted to just say a couple of things. Like, I agree with what everyone has said. It's very interesting. But I think that um, one thing I noticed is that the, well, I appreciate your literal translation, because I think that in some ways, when we read that, maybe we get a better sense of what's really happening here, as opposed to the translator who has added things. Um, I I think particularly the Wan Li Chun, like the 10,000 springs sounds like eternal spring, like forever, you know, this will, this will be in the future that this, we will have this, uh, I presume, you know, the, the Chinese people will come back after being um, like oppressed by the uh, Yuan dynasty in the sense of like forever. So even though the translator has said into spring far and nigh, I think the Wan Li Chun, kind of in the um, literal translation almost gives you a better sense of, of how the uh, poet feels. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is that my understanding is that in many cases during many time frames, you know, poets couldn't criticize whatever government might be there directly. So poetry was frequently very indirect and could be interpreted on several levels, one of which is, you know, just the literal meaning here of the blossoms and the time frame, but the other which might be sim symbolically, um, you know, understanding what this might mean. I think this is great, though. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Indeed, while well, the, the multiple layers, I feel a great poem or anything on art, literature, is to offer the possibility of being interpreted on at, at different layers or from different perspectives, so we can all feel related uh, to the uh, the various layers. Maybe not all, um, but well, there will be something that moves us uh, as well. Reading this from a different time and space. Uh, last but not least, Lenny. <laughs> Lenny. Yeah, yeah, that was one point I was going to make because uh, it is quite universal, I think, in its uh, communication of ideas. Uh, it's of renewal, uh, of uh, being pure with the white uh, snow and the white flower. But, um, and I, I uh, know a, a number of paintings, classical Chinese paintings that has the same idea where it both is a beautiful painting that uh, hints to the uh, occupation of the Mongols, but also can mean something else. And one thought I had, uh, I come from Denmark and uh, you have the same idea there. Just out in my yard here in the United States, I have a little Danish flower called Wintergig where it's a little white flower that comes up through the snow mm. and opens up and then you know that spring is ahead although uh, it doesn't feel like spring so i mm. that's what i immediately i got to think about but i find it's it's very interesting of the universality of the ideas communicated even if you don't know about the mongols and so forth uh, it gives it's like a painting of hope uh, it's a it's a it's a poem of hope, of renewal. That's what I thought. Yeah. Thank you. Well, could you please well, type the, the name of the flower in the chat box? I, it's, it's always uh, interesting to know, uh, especially these terms are, are, are like, if I'm not there, I, I would never come across. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, I know there are some comments in the chat box. Well, uh, I just want to point to um, 
uh, everyone to please take a look. But we, for now, we have to move on uh, to the next part that we will get to write a little bit. Um, before that, let's read together one more time after talked about this poem. I would invite Lin Lao Shi to give everyone a bit of challenge without the pinyin, uh, but, but Lin Lao Shi will lead and we can read this together. Lin Lao Shi. Yeah. Oh, so before I read the poem, so you one question, Fu Mingjie said, he asked the Chinese language, 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 the Great, yeah, great suggestion. Okay, so what I assume everybody got it, what <laughs> Lin Lao Shi suggested. Uh, so we, we uh, Lin Lao Shi will lead in Mandarin Chinese, um, and we have Li Tong, uh, our uh, master student from East China Normal University in New York on, on with us, and she's, she speaks Cantonese. So she can also, read this poem in Cantonese as Cantonese uh, from the modern language point of view. Uh, the pronunciation of Cantonese may be closer to the ancient Chinese pronunciation. So we can at least uh, get a sense how different uh, these two versions could um, uh, could be, uh, could sound. All right, Lin Lao Shi, you go first, Mandarin. Yes, okay, so read after me. Bai Mei, Bai Mei, Bing Xue Lin Zhong, Zhuo Ci Shen, Bing Xue Lin Zhong, Zhuo Ci Shen, Wu Shen, Bu Tong Tao Li, Huan Fang Chen, Bu Tong Tao Li, Huan Fang Chen, Hu Ran Yi Ye, 清香花忽然忽然夜夜清香花赞作乾坤万里春赞作乾坤万里春万里春很好谢谢 好,那现在我来带大家读一次广东话粤语版本Cantonese uh, Word Version 八妹冰雪林中着此身不同桃李云芳尘不言一夜清香发赞作乾坤万里春 Thank you, Li Tong, and thanks, uh, Lin Lao Shi. Yeah, so you can, I, I cannot even myself pronounce uh, or read this in Cantonese. Uh, that's how uh, different the pronunciations are. Um, but well, you can, uh, we can all appreciate the difference and also uh, the sound that it makes. Uh, if you notice, well, this one, I actually just want to point out, there is a reason I separate the words. Um, so you can see the first two lines is a pair and they have exactly the same meter. Stop, bing xue, ling zhong, zhuo, zi shen. There's a, if you read the rhythm and there's the meter is there. And the second two lines are an, a pair and you can see the meter has changed. So even with this four line quatrain, uh, you can uh, get like, well, we can get a sense well how the rhythm could change uh, within the four lines to give a, a little bit more of appreciation of the, uh, the, 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 the changes that it could make. Um, so this is the poem we choose for today and is one reason is for the Chinese New Year. And when we come to, uh, I, I just want to circle back while well, relate to what we're going to write uh, for this time, not a character from the poem, but we may 
for the Lunar New Year, we may see a lot of this word. Jiga. Jiga. Yeah. Have you seen this? Can you tell what the character is? Fu. 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 What's the meaning of Fu? Fortune. Fortune, yes. And blessing, and it has also layers of meanings. But while well, you will see this most common in during the Chinese Lunar New Year, uh, coming in gold or black, uh, the black ink, um, uh, mostly red paper. And sometimes, well, you can decorate for the 2023. It's the year of the rabbit. Sometimes, well, they come in upside down. <laughs> and there's a reason for that because, well, upside down is called Dao, upside down. So Dao Fu means the Fu has arrived. So it's a sort of like uh, give a, a, a wish. So today we are going to write this character, um, Fu. Just a little bit of the story of Fu. This is how we write today. This is in 100 AD, the Xiao Zhuan. Not too different. Uh, still, we can see the left part is written differently, but you can sort of relate the shape. This part is almost identical. Uh, the right part is almost identical. It's just getting more square in the current form. But if we look at an even earlier version, so this one is like uh, 2000, about 2000 years ago compared to the contemporary version. But if we look at maybe another 1000 years earlier, this is the Jingwen, the bronze from the bronze script. And you could see, we start to see it looks quite different. But if we look carefully, we can still relate to some of the parts. You see this part? This is, this represents the table that when you are worshiping your ancestors, there is a table there that you can put food, wine, the treasures, or the incense on the table because you want your ancestors blessing. And they are still here, quite similar. And on top of this table, there are two components. What this part, the one on the right, what do you think it looks like? Jiu Ping. Jiu Ping, yeah, Jiu Ping or Jiu Guan. It's like the wine containers, mm -hmm. which is quite common. The majority of, the, maybe not the majority, but a large portion of the bronzes are actually either wine or food containers. Mm -hmm. And this part, the left part, what is that? Yeah. Jade. Jade, yeah, Xiao An, Heng Hao, Xie Xie. So we talked about this in one last, one previous session. These are the jade, imagine or picturing. This is the disc of the pieces, the jade pieces. And this is the thread that's connecting the pieces together. And we are looking at it from a side angle. And this is a treasure you would want to place on the table to get your ancestor's blessing. You want to show your respect. And on top of that, what is this? This is what? Which? When you are worshiping or when picturing the ancient Chinese, are worshiping the ancestors where? In a, under a roof in a temple? Under the roof, exactly. 
-hmm. At the beginning, it could be the temple could be a family uh, house or a family gathering, uh, a temple in that sense. But this represents the place. It's under a roof and it's everything that's happening inside, showing the respect to the ancestor. So over the years, while well, some of the components got dropped out, but we still keep this one. And oftentimes when you see this part, we call that a radical. It's to show respect. It's to show some, something that's related to, you want to associate the meaning of being respectable or worshiping. And this part, in today, well, we could say it still represents the, the wine container, or someone would say, well, it looks like somebody got enough of food and a little bit chubby, a little bit full-bellied. Um, you could still sort of like, well, get the imagination, go to different directions, but it's related to you get something uh, when someone, when one is blessed, you get enough of um, everything. And that's full, that's fortune. Uh, that's what, especially for the Lunar New Year, uh, everybody wants this for this upcoming entire year. So that's the story of full. And we're always running out of time. There's a bonus activity that mm -hmm. Our um, Meng Yun and Li Tong actually will show everyone how to make this fu on a, uh, a new as a New Year print. Uh, we just recently got a wood block from China that uh, traditionally uh, we can make this character on a piece of red paper for the Lunar New Year. Um, and place it everywhere for getting the blessing. Uh, we will see that after our quick writing. Uh, is your pen or pencil ready? Uh, we can go there. I will stop sharing. And Lin Lao will help me to get the writing pad up. So. I will start with the Xiao Zhuan, the ancient form, uh, not the bronze, but the one that's in the middle. All mm -hmm. right, so usually it's left and right from the top to the bottom. Just one second, I'm going to plug in my computer. So, all right. All right, apologize for that. So the top short line, I, I will make it a little bit longer so everybody can see. This is a short line on the top and then make it a little, slightly longer. And then there is a, the vertical line in the middle of the second and going down. So just trying to keep it even. I'm trying my best, but it's hard to keep that while talking. So there's two line on the side left and right. Remembering this is like a, a table that would, you would place the treasures for the ancestors and the right part on the top. And then this one I would do, because it's the drawn, it's sort of like you have is curved lines. So it's a little bit different. Oh. Yeah, this part is 
uh, it's, it's not desirable. It's supposed to be quite smooth. And then the bottom part. I will do the other half this way too. And then the two lines crossing in the middle. By the way, this is not a real calligraphy. We're learning the structure um, and the style. I'm using this uh, brush. It's a little bit cheating. Uh, we do have a calligraphy program actually going to start February 23rd at China Institute. And we are trying to see how to uh, make it more online. I know some of you, if you can come to China Institute Thursday evening, uh, it's also a monthly program. Uh, Lin Lao Shi has just posted the link there. You can just uh, come and write together. Uh, we will have the brush, the paper, and the ink ready at China Institute. Um, or, because I know some of you are uh, from outside of New York, uh, we will see how to make it also uh, live streaming and we can practice together. So the regular form, the Kai Shu, the one, the version that we are doing today, also from the left. So the square, from my experience, is making it easier to write. As you can see, I was like struggling with the curved, that, 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 that one. And for the square, it's easier to make it a perfect um, shape. This one too. And so with Kai Shu, you want to finish what's inside first. and close it at the end. That's the Kai Shu Fu. Yep. Thank you. And now, I know we are already one o'clock mark, but Meng Yun and Li Tong actually has something to show that how we make this food, this character on a, as a new year print. So if you have time, uh, welcome to stay, uh, or I will see you next, um, next month. That's also March the 3rd, uh, Friday for lunch and learn. All right, I will turn to Li Tong for now. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I'm Li Tong. Yeah, then today we are going to print a fu, and I will be your camera. And this is my friend. Hi, I'm Meng Yun. Uh, today I will show you how to print a fu, and this is what we are going to do. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see, uh, we have a lot of materials on our table. So before I print, I will. Uh, so first one is the wood block. There's a Chinese character Fu in the middle. Yeah, this is a wood block. Mm -hmm. And we have a brush. 
Uh, in Chinese, it's called Zongshua. 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 Yeah. And also, we have a presser. Uh, uh, it's called Zongcha in Chinese. Uh, yeah. Uh, these two materials are made of uh, horse hair. Yeah. And we have a golden ink. Mm. Golden ink. This is golden ink. And some red papers. Okay, uh, let's have a try. Yeah, firstly, uh, we need to put some golden ink into the play. Uh oh. <laughs> And use our brush to dip the ink. But be careful, we need to use the, shell, uh, the brush in a clockwise, the same direction. Then we try to use our brush on our wood block. Also the same direction to make sure the ink are at the head evenly on our wood block. Can I ask, did you need to wet the wood block before you used it? Oh, yes. We have to do some uh, um, painting before we do a perfect one. Yeah. Thank you. And then use the presser to press our wood box, our wrap paper. Yeah. Can you see the full is showing to us the shape of full? Yeah. And leave the wrap paper. Oh, <laughs> and here we go. Full. Nice. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. So that's our full and wish everyone a happy year of the rabbit. This is a generic full, so it can go for any year, any zodiac. Um, and as you see, the, the middle actually, uh, as I'm speaking, you can see these are actually two fruits. It's in Chinese, it's shi <laughs> The Yeah, the, the uh, what's the English word? Persimmon? Um, Persimmon. Persimmons, yes, thank you. Persimmons. Uh, and also on the top, they are like, we have two persimmons. That's shi <laughs> shi. And then there's a sort of a decorative object that these two persimmons are hanging from. In Chinese, it's called ru yi. So going back to the very early, very beginning, we said shi shi ru yi. And that's what this fu also um, sort of embedding that in the writing. Shi shi ru yi. Shi shi ru yi. All right. Thank you, Meng Yun and Li Tong. And thanks everyone for coming to today's Lunch and Learn. Um, yeah, I wish everyone a happy uh, new year and also looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.